pass it over to our amazing and fierce Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion, Dania Matos. Thank you so much, Elisa, and welcome everyone. I love the amazing and fierceness, so I receive it and I will channel it with all of you. Thank you to everyone who made this possible. I get in trouble when I start naming names, so you know who you are and they are listed, introducing themselves in the both invisible and invisible ways in the labor. And thank you to all of you. I know it's the end of a very tough year semester. I know we're holding space for what's happening in the world. And here we are just coming together to center each other, our values, our justice, and our love. And so I really want to thank you. This is our final of our inaugural series of uh, Building Belonging at Berkeley and Beyond. And my heart is so full uh, to end with disability justice. Uh, but no, um, it's not the end. We plan on beginning our next academic year and certainly celebrating the month in October in really important and critical ways. Um, and so I wanna thank you. This was an idea that I had and you all helped bring it to fruition and uh, far exceeded uh, what I first sort of um, had in my, in my mind to do so. So with that, I wanna start with our land acknowledgement. I'm also, um, very much grateful to be pressed to slow down in my speaking uh, for the interpreters. Um, and so I will uh, do that and please nudge me if I'm not doing so. UC Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huchin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chechenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Mwekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of the land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community, inclusion and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. As members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand, but also we recognize that the Mwekma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. I also would like to make the commitment uh, we've talked about not just saying the land acknowledgement, but talking about what your commitment would be. And for me, especially around this topic, is always ensuring that I center disability justice and integrate it into the work uh, that I'm doing. And thank you all for teaching me and stretching me to be a better leader in that. And so with that, I wanted to turn it over to uh, Ella Kahlo, who will be leading us in the discussion today but also to just um, ground us a little bit in the intentionality of the series on critical consciousness. Uh, we have it listed on our website, diversity.berkeley.edu. The concept comes from Brazilian educator Paulo Fiere, in which thinking about how do we embody a mindset of reading the word and the world together. For us, the intention at UC Berkeley is to develop you and ourselves as transformative practitioners whose work centers on restoring shared community values and equality and social justice. So thank you for being here in the name and spirit of that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ella. Great. Thank you so much, Tanya. I really appreciate that. And um, I'll put in a, a tag for that and you know, after the, the reading of the land acknowledgement, if people are interested in learning more about how they can support native communities in the Bay Area, um, I suggest uh, going to the Saborate Land Trust website or the American Indian Child Resource website. Both are Oakland entities or uh, go buy lunch at Cafe Ohlone and put some money into the community. Um, thank you so much for having me here this morning. Uh, my jobs are going to be mainly to facilitate discussion with our incredible panel. Um, and I'll be introducing them to you. But first I was asked to do an introduction talking about the connection between disability justice um, and Freire's concept of critical consciousness um, and the role of critical consciousness in praxis and changing the world. Born in Brazil in 1921 and raised as a poor child in the Great Depression, Paulo Freire was too hungry to learn. 
He failed in school many grades because his circumstances did not allow access to education. Later, his family's circumstances improved and he did succeed academically, becoming first a lawyer, then a teacher. Of his formative experience, he would say, I didn't understand anything because of my hunger. I wasn't dumb, it wasn't a lack of interest. My condition didn't allow me an education. His lived experience revealed for him the relationship between social class and knowledge. As an educator, Fari sought to work with those most oppressed. In a nation where literacy was still required for enfranchisement to the vote, he focused on teaching reading to the very poor, to laborers, designing programs that were highly successful. The 1964 Brazilian coup d'etat, supported by the military and covertly the United States, ended Ferrari's ability to work within the Brazilian system. He was imprisoned, then exiled, but eventually returned to Brazil and would ultimately be named Secretary of Education. In between those two unlikely points, in 1963, Ferrari wrote his seminal work, The Pedagogy of the Poor. It laid out the ideas that would come to deeply influence education and critical pedagogy and a diverse array of liberation movements around the world. Essentially, Farai believed that education is political. Oppressed people can gain consciousness of their own oppression through education. And once aware of the circumstances of oppression, they can engage in praxis, changing their own circumstances and the circumstances of the world through action. As Ferre, this light for liberation was entering the world in the 1920s, in the United States, an oppressive and cruel philosophy was carrying the day. Beginning in 1920, the eugenics movement in the US was launched into law and policy. It was supported by our intelligentsia, political powerhouses like Teddy Roosevelt and the best and brightest minds from premier universities. <clears throat> Dr. Hayden Laughlin from Princeton, who ran the Cold Harbor Laboratory from 1910 to 1925, wrote the model legislation for involuntary institutionalization and sterilization of people with disabilities, specifically to move procreation, to prevent procreation by what he saw as those who were unworthy. This began the dark days. The government would use medicine and academics and take control of the lives of people with disabilities in an organized national fashion. For the next 40 years, untold numbers of disabled people were involuntarily sterilized and institutionalized on the basis of disability but really because they were disabled or poor or culturally or racially suspect or simply inconvenient and it was politically expedient. In California, over 60,000 people were forcibly sterilized, many as young as 10 years old. In the US South, it was disproportionately leveraged against black people. In regions with tribal communities, the majority sterilized were native people. It was always heavily borne by the poor. Eugenics ideology began a decline in the 1950s only because the public finally saw that the Nazi Holocaust was its ultimate expression. As Freya's work was entering the world in the 60s, in the US, a movement for liberation of disabled people began in earnest. Disabled people were inspired by the Black movement for civil rights, increasingly conscious of their own oppression. They began pushing to change circumstances for themselves and for the world through action, rejecting a medical model of disability that pathologized their othered bodies and minds, and adopting a social model focused on the way they were disabled by a society built with them out of mind and out of sight. Please slow down. Okay. In the late 1960s, a Berkeley professor named Jacobus Tenbroek, T-E-N-B-R-O-E-K, who had immigrated to the U.S. as a child and who was partially blind, published an article entitled The Right to Live in the World. It would become a blueprint for the Americans with Disabilities Act decades later. Between those events, a disabled Berkeley student named Ed Roberts, who used an iron lung and a wheelchair, sued the university for the right to live on campus. Like Slow down, students. please. Slow down, please. You're reading. He won. And soon, a group of disabled students had desegregated the Berkeley campus. These students and community members together would engage in praxis, founding the first independent living center in the nation, maybe the world. CILs would be run by disabled people, for disabled people, helping them live outside the institutions and outside of isolation, connecting them to one another, to education and housing, medical and transportation and benefits. This movement that grew would include the longest occupation of a federal building in US history, 
the creation of the greatest ac educational access for the disabled that had been seen, and the coalescing of decades of work into the ADA of 1990, and then amendments in the 2000s. The disability rights movement is one of the most breathtakingly successful movements for liberation the world has seen. The first disability studies program also begun here in Berkeley, created a field through which an understanding of disability from a historical, educational, philosophical, and other positionalities could be examined and vice versa. Yet the ABA generation, those born after the ADA and educated under the IDEA, have helped to illuminate the shortcomings of the movement and created an alternative vision of what the disability community is and who it is. Disability justice is renewing the inquiry into what disabled people need and deserve in order to live in the world and what the world needs and can benefit from from disabled people. A significant critique of the disability rights movement was that it centered white, physically disabled and straight people that it engaged in respectability politics, was essentially neoliberal, and denied disabled people the right to share experiences of pain or suffering, lest the disabled society be discomforted and reject us all. And it relied ultimately on a rights framework and a lobbying class to secure resources and access to the society in its status quo. Disability justice is a response to these concerns it seeks to center the priorities and approaches of the most historically excluded groups, including women, people of color, immigrants, indigenous and tribal people, people who identify as LGBTQIA. Sometimes viewed as a second wave, the disability justice movement seeks to move away from a rights-based philosophy of disability liberation via law, and instead seeks popular support for a cultural rethinking of what is achievable if we evolve our consciousness and change the frame from rights to justice. Critical consciousness and praxis were apparent in the disability rights movement. Yet in the exclusion of so many disabled people and the limitation of change making and the lack of a critique of the society the disabled people were being enfranchised into, it was a more docile liberation than one perhaps would hope for today. It must be said that more radical and liberatory, more conscious and intersectional lives and efforts existed and took place throughout the movement. But we're talking about the elements of the movement that quote unquote took the day, that came to speak for all disabled people at the highest levels of government and society, despite not perceiving them all or prior prioritizing everyone's experiences and needs. While the development of the movement is posited often as an answer or a critique of the disability rights movement, and similarly that critical disability studies serves the same purpose as to traditional disability studies, I find this to be an unnecessary Western construct that serves to sever one generation of change making from the next, and that creates disharmony. Instead, I see the disability justice movement as fulfilling the calling of disability liberation in this era. The movement brings opportunity for community empowerment and education from and by those who most need it. They're expanding the who of disability to include those still most oppressed. And this couldn't happen without simultaneously rejecting respectability politics and a canon that requires denial of pain and denial of suffering. All of this requires engagement with feminism, tribal sovereignty, gender and sexuality, race, environmental justice, the global south, migration and immigration, and all those experiences that color and create the reality of disabled people in the now. Moreover, by rethinking the role of disability and critiquing the neoliberal, revanchist, and oppressive, corporatized, deadly society of today, the disability justice movement creates space for thinking about what we want and don't want to join into or operate within or cooperate with as a people in a movement. Ultimately, disability liberation is an ongoing project for humanity, 
where the disability rights movement served to create a structure for access to education and understanding and to literally free people from incarceration. So a critical consciousness could develop, change could be made. The disability justice movement is in a refreshed, rich dialogue with Ferre's call to praxis now to change the world as it is today, again, in the ways it needs to be changed for the people. So I want to move on now to, um, to our panelists. Um, I'm gonna invite each panelist um, to introduce themselves and to give a short description of their appearance for people who are blind or vision impaired. Um, and then we're gonna move to some questions. So first, um, I want to welcome uh, Doc, uh, Professor Karen Nakamura. Karen, if you can introduce yourself and describe yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, please be part of this panel. My name is Karen Nakamura. I use she, her pronouns. I am a, sadly, middle-aged, uh, genderqueer, um, disabled, um, Asian-American um, person. Um, I am calling in today from my home in Oakland, in occupied Oakland. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Derek Coates, you're next. Hi, my name is Dr. Derek Coates. I um, use he and him pronouns, and I'm an African-American man. I have a guide dog, and I'm wearing sunglasses because I'm blind. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And Steve, you're up next. Hi, I'm Steve Johnson. I'm a middle-aged white man with my brown hair shorted, uh, parted to the side, and I'm calling in from my office at home, which has a chalkboard in the background. Um, Carlos Vasquez. Carlos is working on getting the mute button off there. Carlos, you can take your time. I can I'll move to Rosa and then we'll come back, okay? Um, Rosa Enriquez. Hey folks, my name is Rosa Enriquez. She, her, a pronouns, and um, I am um, a Latina woman with long brown hair. I got my gold hoops on that my dad gave me and I'm wearing some clear framed glasses. I will hand it back to you, Ella. Thank you, Rosa. And I'll introduce myself. I'm Ella Callo. Um, I am a middle-aged woman with dark hair and eyes and um, medium toned skin. Um, I'm a person of mixed descent. I have, um, I identity um, as a disabled person. Um, I have major depressive disorder and a chronic pain condition. Um, I use the she, her series, and I'm also located here in Berkeley. And now I'll hand it to Carlos Vasquez. Hi, my name is Carlos Vasquez. I use the he, him, his series. I am a brown, Latinx male with, um, who is wearing a red shirt um, and who has medium, um, medium long hair um, and, um, and light brown skin. All right, thank you, Carlos. Um, we wanna to talk today about everyone's different experiences and we have a question for everyone. I wanted to start with um, an overall question though that, that we'd like everybody to tell us. How did you become conscious of the issue of disability oppression? Um, how did you start to work on disability justice issues? And what's the most liberatory thing you felt that you've done that you'd like to mention? Um, this time I'll start with Rosa. Thanks, Ella. Um, yeah, great question. Um, I was for, well, I grew up chronically ill. 
Um, and so that was without truly understanding, um, I knew what that felt like. Um, and um, more recently, um, experiencing that as, as an adult um, in the UC system um, of trying to find ways to exist as a disabled graduate student has been um, difficult, but also has been one of the most exciting experiences of my life. Um, having, having done a lot of work um, with the other disabled community on campus um, and beyond, it's, it's just, I think we're at a wonderful point to move forward um, towards a different idea of what disability justice looks like. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Steve, you're next on my line here. Hi, yeah, I uh, don't identify as having a disability that affects me in my daily life. I first worked with people with disabilities when I left university and I worked in a care home with adults with learning disabilities. And that was the first time I experienced how people observed people with disabilities in the community when we would go into town to go shopping and how people were observed differently. So it gave me an awareness at that stage. Uh, I then worked in investigations and uh, for a number of years and the, came to UC Berkeley about 18 months ago. And what really attracted me to this role was taking all my experience and being able to make a difference for people with disabilities and for the university as a whole. That was my main uh, goal for coming here and hopefully this job allows me to do that more than I've already done. It's uh, something I really look forward to. Thank you. Karen. Hi, this is um, Karen. Um, like many people, I think I was in deep denial about this being disabled, um, but that was sort of coincident with being in deep denial about being um, genderqueer and, and ironically also being Asian American. Um, I really saw myself as identityless. Um, and it was really in, um, in grad school when I had this massive sort of realization that in many ways the sort of um, denial of identity, the loss of identity, that is a product of um, of repression, occupation, uh, sort of uh, that um, one of the ways that we are repressed is to feel that we don't have an identity or we don't have claims to identity. And I think that's particularly true in Asian American communities. I think it's particularly true in disabled communities where it's very hard for us often to say uh, we are disabled because we often ask, are we disabled enough? Do I, do I count? I get to count. Um, surely I'm not as disabled as someone else. Um, and so it becomes a difficult category to occupy. Um, but um, that was many years ago. So now, you know, I still, um, so yes, that is my sort of coming together of really trying to understand that even though I might have trouble feeling at times uh, um, worthy of these identities that I think it's also important for me as a professor at Cal to let students know that it is possible um, that, you know, to be an, an adult with, with um, these multiple intersecting um, identities. Well, thank you. Yeah, that is incredibly important. Thank you so much. Um, Derek, and then we'll do Carlos. For me, um, things started with my master status, which is my race. So my most of my life, my race has been reflected to me. I've been legally blind most of my life, but uh, most of my life I could see 2020 in, a, in tunnel vision. Like when you turn the lights off in a cartoon and they show the flashlight beams. That within the flashlight beams, I could see everything. But putting my cane away, not having my dog, I'm an African-American man and people still lock their doors and cross the streets. Um, so my exposure to disability didn't come until uh, pretty much until I lost my vision. Uh, and then my first taste with that was being denied accommodations in my workplace. 
Um, so when did I become conscious of disability oppression? I think, um, I think that first time when I couldn't get what I needed to be able to do the job that I knew I could do. Um, and, um, but before that, I actually, yeah, let me, let me change that. Before that, I actually provide the complaint resolution resources for students with disabilities that wouldn't, weren't able to get their accommodations implemented appropriately in their classes for about six years. Prior to that, I didn't really know much about what discrimination was. Uh, I had experienced it from my race, but not my disability. Um, the liberatory thing that I think I've done um, is in being able to resolve those complaints informally without having to do investigations and fix things and enable students to be able to remain enrolled in the class, receive the accommodation, and be academically successful. Back Thank to you, Ella. And Carlos. So um, my journey with discovering disability oppression started earlier, like actually in kindergarten. I had a very horrible um, kindergarten experience being a disabled child wanting to be in a mainstream environment. Um, so um, my, pro my teacher um, really um, didn't want to teach me because she didn't believe I was capable of achieving more academically because I was disabled and uh, she, she thought I was going to be homebound for the rest of my life, which was really painful for a five-year-old me and my family. And after that, to be honest, I, I struggled to find my voice as a disabled student in elementary and high school. I was, I was bullied, told by my peers that they didn't want to play with me because a disabled child couldn't play soccer, therefore I was useless to be a playmate to them. And I struggled, I cried like countless nights to my parents after school because I was fed up with the disability oppression I experienced in um, my daily life as a child. So um, flash forward to Cal, I like was conscious of the positive side of my disability identity because um, I soon realized that there's other like others that share similar experiences as me and who accept me who I am and who really like welcome me as an equal and not as this weird um, creation that um, like fell out of nothing to like try to play with them like and I like specifically got involved in disability leadership 
like I didn't realize that um, my identity could be mobilized politically on campus, which was really cool. So yeah, um, that's my journey, like from disability oppression to disability consciousness and disability empowerment. Thank you so much, Carlos. That's really wonderful. Thank you very much. All right. I'm going to move into our questions now. Um, just so the audience knows, some people drafted their own. Um, I drafted others. And um, I think we're going to be fine on time here. So I'll go ahead and, um, and read the questions long form. If we start to run out of time, I can change that. So we're gonna start off with Rosa. Um, since the reauthorization of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act in 2004 and the ADA amendments of 2008, many more disabled students go to college. Uh, Berkeley's Disabled Students Program has seen their numbers quadruple in 10 years. And for the first time, we see large cohorts of disabled graduate students nationally. This is welcomed and it's wonderful but in a neoliberal, austerely funded state like California, this means that support and funding for disabled grad students and undergrads has not increased in line. You're just completing your graduate program. What would you like to share about being a part of this first disabled graduate student wave? Uh, what were the challenges? And of course, how did COVID impact this experience? What changes would you like to see? And how are you feeling about moving into the world beyond the campus and into your chosen fields um, as a disability professional? Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll start off um, by saying I just graduated with my master of social welfare and um, I almost didn't. Um, I was told at the beginning of the fall 2021 school year to take a leave of absence on the basis of my disability um, because I require um, remote learning accommodations um, because I'm immunocompromised, so high risk being inside of a classroom, um, especially during the Delta variant spike um, before boosters was just simply um, not not an option for me um, and neither was taking a leave of absence um, for those of you that don't know taking a leave of absence actually means you lose about 15 percent of your fees and tuition alone as well as health care um, so telling this to a disabled student um, you know my prescriptions are nearly two thousand a month um, losing my health care would have been um, deadly so I um, I really started to poke into what other students were experiencing as graduates. And unfortunately, I was not the only student told to take a leave of absence in a graduate program based on this type of reasonable access request. And um, we were able to work together with allies at the Disabled Students Program disability access and compliance. And of course, the ASUC Disabled Students Commission um, to advocate for our right to an education um, as this new generation of disabled graduate students. Uh, because this is the first time we're in this landscape for the most part in large numbers, um, I believe we have 750 registered um, graduates um, with the Disabled Students Program this year, which is close to double from what has been in, in um, the past three years. So there's clearly a growing um, group of us, which is so exciting. And there's more of us that are feeling comfortable disclosing uh, because a lot, a lot of us have always been here, but have just not felt safe to disclose and get the support that we need. So this is a wonderful shift and um, now it's about finding access and accommodation that really matches 
what our needs are. And I think one of the most exciting um, new uh, work groups that's um, going to be coming out this summer or fall is looking at neurodiversity and what graduate student accommodations are. Um, so what that could mean for things like qualifying exams for doctoral students, um, for advising sessions, um, for library research. So all of these other pieces of academia that really haven't had to integrate um, the, the access needs of disabled graduate students are starting to shift. And I think Berkeley is a wonderful place to start the shift. Um, even though I was told to take a leave of absence, I graduated. Um, so there's room to push back. Um, and I think that is so incredibly important to know. And, uh, you know, the disabled community is so strong <laughs> um, and so passionate and fierce. Uh, we've been lucky to make these movements, but I'm aware that we are, UC Berkeley is one of the, the best places for disabled graduate students and it's still so hard. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done across the board um, to really create um, spaces that grad students can navigate with ease and really be successful. And um, I'm going, you know, I am a social worker. Um, this means a lot of different things. At this point, it's probably closer to more mac macro program um, development and management, which is what I, I really enjoy doing um, and seeing how we can, um, and in higher ed, how can we support students doing this work, living at many different intersections, um, as many folks have brought up. Um, we, we are very diverse, and so it's incredibly important that we have a, a big pool of folks to talk to and learn from and co-create in this together. Um, yeah. Thank you, Rosa. That was a really robust, rich response. Appreciate it. Um, one of the things you mentioned was how there have been a lot of disabled students here that may not have always felt comfortable or safe being visible. You know, we also have to remember that while we have big numbers registered at the SP, like 5,000 students, there are like 8,000 that report themselves as disabled on the My Experience survey. Now, some of them just may not need accommodations. Their disability may not require them. Um, but there's probably a cohort there that are those people that are still not sure about disclosing this identity and that really speaks volume to the, the, the awareness of the societal ableism that we still deal with. Thank you. Derek, many disabled students attend college successfully, speaking of which, without requesting academic accommodations in their courses. However, there are others that need to request accommodations for every course for every semester throughout college because they need them for equal access. How does Paolo Freire's construction of critical consciousness help students navigate the political, social, and educational contradictions of reasonable accommodation and interactive process? When students with disabilities encounter institutional and interpersonal barriers to their success, how can their consciousness of inequality and injustice become identity-based self-advocacy? Well, first, I would like to say that I came new to uh, Paulo Freire's work. And so I hope to do justice to that work. Um, I've thought about this a, a great deal since this topic came up. Um, I wanna do justice to the many students who've had to encounter uh, academic disenfranchisement survived and graduated and earned a college degree. Uh, I want to give justice to the unending, unending devotion and commitment of the people on our campus who have uh, fought for them, who have encouraged them, who have supported them, who have helped them to navigate through um, this disability accommodations process, especially for those who are adventitiously disabled and they don't have a disability identity. That disability identity is now imposed upon them and they've got to figure out which direction to move in. So first I'm gonna describe the problem and then I'm gonna describe uh, how the ADA can actually be a tool of critical consciousness. 
So who are the oppressed and, and what is the pedagogy? A student is seated in a chair in an office of an instructor at a university on the East Coast. The instructor has a document in their hand and they're reading from a list of accommodations. The instructor says, okay, I see you have makeup exams. I see you get extended time on exams also. Um, oh, and you have audio record, wait, audio recording. I'm sorry, you can't audio record in my class. Um, that violates the rights of other students to privacy. Uh, do you have any more questions? The student says no, departs the class. What is the problem with this situation? Well, what do we know? The student is eligible for an accommodation based on the letter that the professor was reading from that authorizes them to receive that accommodation. We know the student has requested an accommodation and that accommodation has been denied. We also know that the instructor has imposed what I call an all or nothing disability accommodations definition of the situation. This means the student can either comply with taking the class without accommodation or not. So how is this inequality and injustice? When we think about inequality in terms of structural inequality, note that the instructor of record has exercised their legitimate authority to unilaterally deny the access for the student. This access, this denial rejects the academic status of the student to request the accommodation as codified in the official notice the instructor was reading from. The power of the instructor to do this without challenge, without any um, process, is what institutional discrimination looks like. Now, let me point out the injustice. Compliance with the instructor's decision means remaining enrolled in the course without accommodation and experience the very barrier to learning the audio recording was designed to mitigate. This means experiencing the frustration of failure and the stress of having to take the class without notes. Now, let me point out the oppression. The likely fact is that this is just the next first time this, uh, this student has experienced this academic disenfranchisement. Each time it is stressful and each time, um, at times it's psychologically emotion and emotionally painful. The key point is we can observe the birth of critical consciousness in this type of a scenario. As, academic, um, as academically oppressed students think about and understand that they are being academically disenfranchised, their views of themselves in relation to the academic accommodations process change. There are three concepts that I understand from my reading of critical consciousness that we can use to make sense of this kind of a situation critical reflection, critical motivation, and critical action. So what are moments of critical reflection? Cocking their head, the student reflects on the interactional work they've been involved in, and they recognize the injustice. So hold on a minute. The instructors in my undergraduate courses and the courses I've already taken in my major last semester, the semester before last year, they didn't deny the accommodation. They didn't end the interactive process. My instructors did not demand that I obey their decision and take the class without class notes. They didn't infer that I was going to violate the rights of other students to, uh, to privacy. They didn't ask if I was gonna cheat when I had to take a makeup exam because I had an accommodation, an exacerbation of, of my disability. They didn't ask if I was gonna cheat because I needed to take frequent breaks and had an accommodation to do so. They didn't tell me I was getting an unfair advantage because I had extra time on an exam. And these instructors did not tell me that I don't look like I have a disability or tell me that I just needed to work harder. That's one sector. But what about institutional treatment? Critical consciousness is also born when they think about the notice of accommodation. They realize, wait a minute, if I look at this letter, this notice has my name, it has my student identification number. It has uh, the name of the course, the instructor's name. It has the list of the accommodations that the campus has authorized, no matter where it is in the country. It has the signature of the person who authorized the accommodations that I requested that they mutually agreed to provide. And it also has, wait a minute, it also has this thing called the Americas with Disabilities Act referenced 
and it has Section 504 of the 1973 Act also referenced. These moments of critical reflection reveal that in fact students are not powerless, but in fact the ADA is an exquisite tool of critical consciousness. Now let me move to the second concept, critical motivation. And that's perceived efficacy and commitment to pursue justice and confront injustice. Because of the ADA, instructors cannot just unilaterally deny requests for reasonable accommodations and end the interactive process. Students can say no to uh, disability accommodations, what I call Jedi mind tricks. Uh, when an instructor denies the accommodation and that's supposed to just be it. Well, in truth, that's not it. When you request an accommodation, if they deny that accommodation, then another accommodation that provides both reasonable and effective access needs to be provided. Because of the ADA, I don't have to accept being labeled as a deviant for disobeying the legitimate authority of the professor to deny my class notes. Because of the ADA, I don't have to endure the psychological and emotional and physical stress of what it means to not get my accommodation and have to figure out how do I succeed in this class without class notes. Because of the ADA, I don't have to suffer from the psychological and emotional assault that instructors um, inflict when they use ableist microaggressions and micro invalidations to silence my disability or to dismiss my disability. Now I'd like to, last, to touch on the last concept of critical consciousness and that's critical action. Nothing happens without action. In these scenarios, I will call action self-advocacy. The ADA has a built-in mechanism for self-advocacy. It's called a complaint. Every college is required to have a complaint resolution procedure. Because of the ADA, students can disagree with the instructor's decision to outright deny the accommodation and not provide an alternate accommodation. And, and they, can escape being, um, they can escape being in a situation in which they have to take a class without accommodation, without equal access. Because of the ADA, a student can uh, disobey the legitimate authority of the instructor to close the interactive process and reject that unilateral decision by requesting the interactive process be reopened and revisited. And all that has to happen is they file a complaint. Um, not all accommodations fundamentally alter a course or create an undue administrative burden. However, some do. And if they do, they do. But if they don't, critical consciousness becomes the bridge that we can use to find out. Because of the ADA, students have a right to do just that, to find out whether or not this does fundamentally alter the course, whether or not I do have to take this class without class notes, without being subjected to harassment or discrimination or dehumanized. They have a right to find out in the name of the campus that reviewed their application for admission and decided to admit them and believed that they could contribute and earn a college degree. They have a right to find out in the name of all of the instructors that are not denying their accommodations, but are encouraging them and watching them grow and being a partner in their success. They have a right um, to um, find out in the name of the academic advisors that have to help them chart the course in the name of the disability uh, specialists that work with them to figure out, well, this accommodation didn't work, but what about this accommodation? To try to figure out how they can do their best and perform the tasks that they need to earn to be successful in a course. Thank they you. have a right to find oh, out sorry, because they have sorry. a right to, uh, to a college degree. Every day, instructors and students successfully work together to have accommodations appropriately implemented successfully. And they build successful partnerships uh, all the time. And we only hear about those scenarios in which it falls apart or it gets destroyed. Unfortunately, there are jerks in every group, but there are more people that are kind, supportive, compassionate, interested in student success, interested in seeing students thrive and successfully graduate with flowers falling from the sky. So I would say be optimistic. Sometimes that means turning down your hypervigilance because you might be working with the person who really wants to support your success. Um, and when necessary, invoke the ADA so that you can be academ academically successful and, and uh, make that and enfranchise yourself 
to that academic success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek. That was wonderful. For people who don't know, you know, Derek's been um, a disabled grad student, uh, a disabled staff person here at Berkeley um, for many, many years, and uh, both advocating with, for students within DSP and also um, employees uh, within HR before um, before his current iteration on campus. So he uh, he knows of what he speaks. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to go next to Karen. Karen, in many ways, uh, the heart of the disability rights and independent living movement historically has been the removal of architectural barriers, creation of physical access. Amy Hammer has written that critical disability studies should reintegrate universal design practice in a project to formulate, quote, a nuanced new materialist and historical disability epistemology particularly engaging with scientific knowledge. Can you speak to the, the promises and the limitations that universal design presents? Do you think that the needs of people with physical access issues and around the physical built world are, are being sidelined or lost a bit as the movement tips towards a focus on the needs of people with psychiatric disabilities, chronic illnesses, and neurotypical conditions? To what extent does or doesn't the disability lab, your disability lab, embrace universal design and why? Uh, thank you. You know, it's 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 hard to follow um, Derek uh, with expect with such a powerful uh, uh, um, note. Um, you know, I don't want to to downplay the importance of. Uh, you know, forebears in pushing for, through things such as the Rehabilitation Act or the ADA. I think those were incredibly important pieces of legislation. And the place where it had the most impact was changing our built environment. That, you know, it's, I think it's only when we tend to go to places that are inaccessible, we realize just how much of our built environment has become accessible. My, my um, favorite written course is New York. It's only when you go to New York, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, this subway station doesn't have an elevator or escalator and the steps are really slippery. <laughs> um, or, oh my gosh, all the buildings are walk-ups. <laughs> um, or if you go to Europe and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, everything's a cobblestone and, and it's really hard to, to navigate. Um, or Japan, oh my gosh, all the restaurants require three steps up or everyone's apartment requires three steps up. That you realize just the importance, just that, that, that the changes to the built environment that the ADA pushed have really transformed our world. And the principles of universal design that came out of that movement, this notion that, hey, we can just make a few tweaks to how we design things so that we can include a greater number of people who, who can um, um, uh, you know, access the world, access um, um, the built environment will be greater is, is, is incredible, right? So you know, simple things like a, a one of the core sort of UD universal design sort of showcases is curb cuts. Curb cuts have been Fantastic, everyone uses them from people with strollers to bicyclists to, to wheelchair users. Um, automatic doors, um, another UD sort of showcases have been fantastic, right? You no longer have to like pull on a door to get in. Everyone can access it. It's a fantastic piece. But just like the ADA a Re Re Rehabilitation Act and um, the principles behind UD have always been around um, physical disabilities, um, mostly um, um, mobility and, and, and uh, vision and um, deafness. Um, and again, it's, it's fantastic, but there are moments when you realize you're, you know, I'm, I'm in a classroom and I realize, hey, you know, there are visual fire alarms um, for students who are deaf, for faculty, people who are deaf, 
um, there is an elevator for someone who's using a chair to come. Um, you know, we have a print media service if you um, uh, can access the slides or the text. But what are we really doing for students um, who have a psychiatric disability? Are we changing any of the built environment? Um, many of the surveys that ASU have done have shown 50% of grad students in psychiatric distress. Are we creating an environment which is either causing, amplifying, or just treating as, as normal the fact that graduate students are in psychiatric distress? Um, are we disabling them somehow? Why don't we put some of the same effort that we think about in, um, in building design into thinking through curricular design or other aspects of the university? Um, and it's not just psychiatric disabilities, it's neurological disabilities. Why are we in a, um, still in an environment where, um, you know, people who suffer from seizures, for example, their fear often is not the seizures, but if they have a seizure um, in a public space, someone will call 911, um, an ambulance will come, the, um, the ambulance will, more or less force them to go to the hospital. They'll have to be treated. And something that could have just been dealt with in 20 minutes in a quiet room suddenly becomes an all day affair with $8,000 in ambulance fees and, and ER fees and so forth um, that have to be battled and dealt with. And that's, that's the fear. It's not the actual, the actual disability itself. And so, you know, what, how are we thinking about our, our built environment in ways that can accommodate um, a broader range of people with different um, minds and bodies? Um, the ability to go out and access public transportation, um, uh, to access public buildings is, is really fantastic, but it doesn't do much if, if you're on dialysis. It doesn't do much if um, your diabetes makes it difficult to go out or your asthma makes it difficult to go out. And so some of the intersectional issues that affect um, black and brown people aren't properly accommodated by the ADA. The ADA envisions this sort of neoliberal society where everyone is, is rich and a consumer of public products um, and is, you know, has that sort of capacity and you know, oh, it's only the disability that's preventing them from being a world-class lawyer or a, you know, a high earning doctor. Um, and, and so things like the ADA Rehabilitation Act ignore generations of trauma, um, environmental um, um, uh, trauma, pollution, destruction, um, um, generational trauma, um, police violence, all of the other things that actively um, immigration laws seek to disable large parts of our community. And for me, the main sort of takeaway for disability justice has been to refuse to separate those, to say, oh no, these are disability issues and these are issues around poverty or these are issues around colonialism or these are issues around um, race. Um, and so forth. And to really try to think of them as ultimately all connected. That is some of the ways that racism operates is through the language of disability. Um, you know, um, black and brown people who are disabled are both, you know, over, uh, uh, many times overserved in a prison to pipeline um, um, pathways, whereas um, um, White folks are disabled. Special education provides a whole different set of, of resources for them. Um, and so everything, I, I feel everything is co connected in, in, some, in some fundal fundamental ways. You know, um, our very brilliant disability studies scholar, Sonora Taylor, has talked about disabled landscapes and how that fits into large notions of colonialism and environmental pollution and the sort of the, the right of the military to, to 
to leach toxic chemicals into, into the ground. And that to be a mechanism by which people are disenfranchised from their land. So that is, that is why I think disability justice is really important because it, it forces us to connect those things and, and really reach out to a much broader community um, um, within, within Cal, within, within a, you know, a, um, um, the nation that, that captures, I think really what, what I think we hope to do in the disability movement, which is the liberation of, of, of everyone. So thank you for a really fantastic question. Thank you so much, Karen, that was fabulous. I really love between you and Derek him talking about the strengths and what the ADA can provide and you're talking about the gaps that were left and what needs to be provided. And that really is, you know, I think um, our best hopeful conceptualization, right, of our current moment. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask you to answer a quick follow-up question from the audience. Um, let's see here. Do you think that accessibility is more on the forefront with the experiences from the pandemic and online work and on online learning? If so, how could we increase accessibility demands and make education and work more equitable? Yes, you know, um, the pandemic was really great because it showed everyone to be, well, many people to be liars. Right. So for a long time, they were like, oh, no, we couldn't possibly do remote work um, because, you know, it, 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 just the logistics could have happened um, or, oh, my gosh, we could never do remote lectures. You know, we don't know how to teach remotely. And so so now we know that's a lie. <laughs> it can happen. Yes, it takes work and takes that you have to adapt things. But we also, I also see this huge push back to the old normal and, um, and a lot of us are fighting. It's like, no, you know, you can't, you can't have given us a year and a half of, 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 of this access, which wasn't perfect. It left a lot of people out, um, but it included some people. And we're not saying, you know, I, I think we're saying that we want it. We want it all in some ways, <laughs> um, and you can do it. You you have shown us that you can do it. So don't say you you can't do it, and that um, there is only one form of education is that's the best form of education, or there's only one form of how how to work that's the best form. No, both can co co coexist at the same time, and, and we don't want to go back to the old normal. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, I'm going to turn to Steve next. So Steve, psychologist Jennifer Freud described institutional betrayal as wrongdoings perpetuated by an institution, perpetrated upon an, by an institution, upon individuals dependent on that institution, including failure to prevent or respond supportively to wrongdoings by individuals within the institution. Disabled people sometimes have been betrayed by many institutions. Um, medicine, education, social work, policing, among them. You grew up in Northern Ireland during the Troubles and you still chose to go into policing. Did you witness or experience institutional betrayal, bias? How did you navigate that as part of the institution itself? How does this impact your work investigating grievances for disabled people? Thank you. Yeah, I was very lucky growing up. I didn't I don't feel like I experienced institutional uh, bias, um, but I certainly, when I became, uh, um, I worked for the, for the police as a civilian crime scene investigator. So I went to pretty much anybody's house who had been a victim of crime. And I was listening to their experiences from all different parts of the community and how their lived experiences were not my lived experiences and how they were, they felt that, you know, the police would never do anything. The police weren't interested in solving their crime. There was no point in me doing anything. Why was I there? Those sort of experiences that they had had in the past. And that gave me my personal responsibility to make clear, you know, I am here to try and help you, to try and find evidence, to try and find out who has done this to you. That is my role. 
And, you know, I take that as, you know, very seriously. And that is my personal responsibility to do the best that I can in any job that I do. Um, and I think that is something that I've definitely brought to my role here is to, I've sort of seen things going back to what Karen said and what I've read about certain things about having steps for, you know, going into a building and people say, well, you know, we've been here 30 years and nobody's ever complained before. It's like, you never thought that they couldn't actually get into your building and therefore they weren't able to complain to you. And I still hear things now, you know, some people will come to me and say, well, you work at the university, you're not interested in actually changing anything. And as I said earlier, you know, that's one of the big things about my role is like, we do want to change things. We do want to make things better. And we want things to be universally designed so that everybody has the same access. And, you know, what I'll say to some people and what I've learned in my years, many years of doing investigations is don't assume anything and um, don't try to understand someone else's lived experience. I can't, I can't understand somebody else's lived experience with disability unless I've lived without myself. And everyone's experience with disability is extremely different because every disability is different. And everybody's lived experience in all, whether they've been the victim of crime, some people don't care. Some people are absolutely devastated that someone's been in their house. So there's all those lived experience that you can't understand unless you've lived it yourself. So that's just something I've learned and something I would say to everybody is we all have a personal responsibility to try and make things more accessible for everybody, to try and not understand the lived experience, but to try and understand that there are things that everybody can do to actually make things more accessible and to more universally design their courses, their buildings, their whatever they're providing to the university campus. Um, we can all do something to make things better. Uh, there are numerous resources available, and I think some people don't know where to go to ask, and this is a great forum to say there are plenty of resources here. There's the DSP, there's our office, and there are many, many links on all our websites and Disability Lab everywhere else to try and find resources. If you're not sure what to do, we will direct you to the right direction. Um, but yeah, that's really sort of, it is more about everyone taking their personal responsibility to just make everything better for everybody else. Um, and if everybody did a little bit to look at what they do in their daily course or their daily job or whatever it is to say, if I had somebody with a disability, no matter what it is, how could this be made more accessible? And I think that's, you know, people don't think of it as their first, uh, first thought when they're designing something is like, how is this going to be made accessible? And that's something that everybody I think could do. Thank you, Steve. Um, another, that was great, thank you. Another question has come up, so I'll ask you as a follow-up. Um, how can we address instances of ableism and advise students, maybe what should we advise students who are being refused accommodations? Um, there's, there are, as I said, there are resources. If you're part of a course and you're not getting your accommodations, DSP or your first port of call, if you're in your job and you're not getting accommodations you need, at any time you can reach out to us and just let us know what's happening. I'm more than willing to have a conversation with anyone to say, you know, we will find you the right resource to answer the question. Uh, it doesn't always need a formal grievance, as Derek was saying earlier, we would much prefer to resolve things with people um, informally instead of going down the formal grievance process. The formal grievance process is always there, but we would much prefer to know what is going on. And if, if there are things happening to one person, it is more than likely than not, as Rosa mentioned when she looked into stuff, that things are happening to other people who maybe won't come forward. So just by coming forward and raising an issue, we might be able to do something about it and therefore improve it for everybody else. And that's what we're really about, is trying to improve it for everybody. Does that answer the question? I think so, yeah. It, it definitely, that for students, the first port of call would be the SP if there's an issue of denial of accommodation. And if they then want to come even to DAC to, um, to talk about an issue of concern because other people may be having it too, you start to see a pattern. Right? And that's when that's when Steve can really engage with departments um, or grievance if needed. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move next to Carlos. So, Carlos, you identify yourself as a disabled brown Latinx man who is a son of Mexican immigrants. 
How does being Latino play a role in your life with a disability? What kind of experiences do you face when you're visiting family in Mexico because of your disability? Because of your, based on your experience in the US school system, what are some of the challenges that disabled Latinx identifying students face when trying to move into higher education? Oh yeah, thank, thank you so. Uh, so I think uh, being Latino and being disabled has really taught me how to uh, perceive um, how others in my community perceive me and my identities like like honestly is um the perceptions are completely different than like from when i speak for example to um someone on the uc berkeley campus in general so um for example, um, bringing up my own family um, in Mexico while you're visiting them, um, they um, are incredible that I am able to attend UC Berkeley as a disabled um person and that's when various stigmas are arising like oh um, he only like got a minute because of pity oh he got a minute because he had someone to help him do his work or stuff like that, or um, in general, outside of um, the, the educational context um, within the Mexican community, I've seen a lot of the stigmas arise. For example, my disability is a curse. Um, in my family, the curse, like, because of having a child with a disability, or I'm unintelligent, or um, I fully depend on my parents' wishes, like, kind of true, however, um, I, they do not understand why I depend on my parents. They just assume, like, and like, although there's like, um, the Mexican parents, like, tend to, like, say to their children as, the grocery stores um like don't look at them all the the their children are curious about my disability but um like they don't allow um they don't allow that communication to flow between them and the child they um, say don't ask as a rule i like and i just um like think to myself as a more rude for you to limit the ability for your children to get to know me better. So yeah, a lot of stigmas are like 
I faced a lot of stigma in my communities, and like those are hurtful um, in general as to the last question. Um, I don't, I want to say that the biggest barrier and a Latinx identifying disabled student, high school student trying to enter higher education has to be the like perception of themselves and seeing themselves actually get into higher education to actually see themselves as scholars. I think like, because all those around me are like conditioned to tell us, oh, you are disabled, therefore you cannot, um, like you cannot achieve more, um, we, I, not a lot of people like me tend to shy away from um, achieving a higher ed like after high school. So, for example, one of, one of my friends who, one of my high school friends who is identifies as Latinx and from an indigenous Mexican family was like constantly told by um like by the aides around us like you are low income you will never um go to college and while you're like while you're like I think they were trying to be realistic that's kind of hurtful to be told told that because of your circumstances you are limited to achieve like a lot um, and people don't allow you to go beyond your circumstances. They are holding you back. Um, and so yeah, it's kind of hurtful. Um, yeah. Um, and that's a hard topic for me because like I would like more people like that look like me or who hold similar identities as me to just be given the opportunity and be seen as live gift him in scholars. That's really powerful, Carlos. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, the absence of, of seeing your own people on campus is an yeah, this indicator of the oppressions that are happening out there to people like like your friend. Yeah, that's that's sort of a daily reminder, right? That's that's very powerful. Thank you. And on that note, I'm going to wrap up our discussion portion of uh, today's event. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. That was just an amazingly rich sharing. Um, and I, I so appreciate the time that you've taken to be here with us and to share with us your own personal lives and your, your feelings politically and as part of, of a movement. Um, at this point, we're going to move to a participant Q&A. Um, we have one question already. Um, in the queue, I guess. Um, hold on for a second. Oh, there it is. Um, okay. And the question is, 
what sort of restorative justice remedies are administrators providing when a student has experienced prolonged disability discrimination during their academics at Cal? Example given, academics probation, loss of financial aid, loss of housing. Um, I, I'm, I'm an administrator here, so I, I think I'll, I'll answer that one if it's okay. Um, I've really been thinking recently that, you know, we have a restorative justice center on campus. And yet, to my knowledge and from my own inquiries, it's never been used um, in this sort of situation. And I think that there is a lot of potential for calling on that um, venue and that milieu to help people reintegrate um, when they have experienced uh, chronic traumas around their disability or, or intersectional identities at the university. Um, you know, we do have cases that are extremely complex that came, so, you know, when I came in three years ago, there are cases that have been ongoing, cases meaning people and having issues that have been ongoing for years. So that absolutely is a need. At, at this point, it's more a matter of, we developed a grievance process um, and a process of tracking developments that could be negative for students on campus and of ensuring that there is um, a proper investigation, a proper outcome, and that people have a sense in the end that they've received some sort of justice for what they've been through. But that does it, yeah, at the end of the day, do the same thing as restoring um, community um, or restoring sort of the, the hoop uh, between the university and, and the students. I think especially as we now, I mean, it's a very different time in the 1960s and 70s when the movement started here, right? 25% of our faculty and staff also identify as people with disabilities. Many people that are here were students with disabilities at Cal previously. Um, and so there really is a hoop in a community and we do need to preserve that. And to preserve that, we may need something more than a Western construct of, you know, investigate, determine who's wrong, do something about it. Um, that that uh, idea of restorative justice, I think, is powerful and timely.